So Psalm 84, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young. A place near your altar, O Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength, till each appears before God and Zion. Hear my prayer, O Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, O God of Jacob. Look upon our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. O Lord Almighty, blessed is the man who trusts in you. Your house, there is one day in your house. 
glory to you, God. Seated high above. And yet, the one who chooses to make your dwelling place in our hearts. We just glorify your name this morning, Lord Jesus. I just want to say we love you. We love your presence. We just want more of you in this place, Lord. Amen. Holy Spirit you will be poured out afresh this morning we will hear the cry of our hearts Lord, for more of you
I pray Holy Spirit you will flood this place, wash away heaviness of heart, burdens that we've come with, worries, anxieties, pressures. That instead we may feel the heaviness of your presence, the weight of your glory in this place. Just like you carried your people, Lord, from Egypt on eagles' wings, that you would do the same today, Lord. Just as your breath brought life to dry bones, or breathe into us today, we pray. Your spirit went and bring new life, bring transformation, bring healing, bring deliverance, bring hope and peace and joy. Most of, all, most of all, Lord, draw us closer to you. We want our eyes to be open to your beauty and glory, your majesty, your splendor. We want our hearts to be flooded with your, the Father's love. That even today, Lord, during this service, we will in some way be changed in the image of our Savior. In Jesus' name, Amen.
Truly, Father, that is our heart's cry today. Lord, we know that there is so much more that we can have than what we currently have. And our hearts long for more. Lord, we sense the wind rising. We sense an excitement brewing across the world. And we know that you are on the move. And so we want to join you today, Lord, in whatever it is that you want to do in us as individuals in this body of believers right here today and in different places in India, around the world, Lord, we just want to join in that chorus of angelic activity. We want to be a part of what is happening and what is going to happen, Lord. Our hearts long, Father, for that billion soul revival. Really, Lord, just the thought of it makes it makes our hearts pound with excitement. So come, Lord Jesus, do it again. Do it in greater measure than you have ever done before. So our hearts join with yours as we prepare the way today. As we open our hearts to your heart and follow in obedience. So that that wind which is blowing will blow through us and in us and change the world forever. We thank you, Jesus, that we can partner with you in this. We just ask that we may be faithful and attentive and obedient. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Just reading Sandhya's prayer, praising God for being a loving father, for being a constant source of strength and comfort, praising God for his word. Thank you, Jesus, for reassuring that you are all we need, praising you for giving me another year, for all the experiences of the past year that has brought me closer to you. Love you more for the godly people around me, most of all, Thank you for your words in Isaiah 66, verse 2. This is the one I esteem, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Father, thank you for this life. Amen.
I'm just so grateful to God for letting His love, and even as we were singing this, you know, last song, uh, "Church on Fire," I was thinking of, you know, what is a church? It's uh, where two or more are gathered. You know, it's not a numbers thing. Uh, God is there, and um, you know, it's His love that's manifest. And uh, you know that the the bridge that goes standing together, sister and brother, feels like heaven. Anything that anything can happen right now, and that's literally like the story of my life. And what I'm trying to say is, I'm leading up to this. Uh, so uh, there was a testimony that of uh, so most of you really already know my testimony so i won't go into the details but uh, there was a, a testimony that was short uh, my my personal testimony and uh, that was released a few days ago online and uh, i was just so amazed at firstly the response which has been uh, surprisingly positive and again, all praise to God. But I'm just, uh, again, it's been such a reminder that um, to me that this has really been all about God's love revealed through the church, you know, through a church on fire, a church on fire burning with his love, you know. And um, when I've been talking to so many of my friends here and, you know, telling them, uh, because people would be like, oh, we saw your testimony, it was so awesome and whatever. But I'd be like, actually, this testimony is about you guys, you know, because I really feel that. And that's really what I wanted to say. Yes, I'm now coming to the point. <laughs> yeah, I honestly feel that my life and the story of my life is really just a canvas for God to paint his story about the church. You know, because I really wanted him to use my life to talk about what a group of people who are so passionately in love with God and therefore how they can love people out of the way they love God, you know. 
and that's what I've seen this group do and that's what I see them do over and over and over again you know without judgment and without compromise you know uh, I've seen you guys do that you did it for me you do it for others and uh, I just want to thank God for all that he's done in my life and I want to thank God for all of you and uh, yeah, just give yourselves a hand and <laughs> give God a hand because really, it's just so phenomenal. And really what the other thing I wanted to say was that I really, um, and I think this is also a, a, a prayer that I really want uh, people to know, you know, that it's it's so simple to know how to love people, you know, some a, a person who's different. Um, it's not complicated, you know, you just, you just, it's we just love you know it's not about sending them off for counseling or <laughs> sending having us yeah doing something different it's just it's just knowing how to love like jesus loves so and that's what all of you did for me so thank you um i just wanted to thank god today that in um on Tuesday, we took uh, our middle schoolers, uh, six, seventh, and eighth. We took them to um, their for their first CSR trip in two and a half, three years, and I was I was completely dreading it. Um, first of all, those trips are always completely exhausting because we're out and about and it's hot and whatever, whatever. Um, and uh, my group went to Welfare of Stray Dogs um, that used to be here at Ma Lakshmi. And now they've shifted to a place in Shuri, and I was a little worried about, you know, what was that place going to be like? And um, it was very comfortable. It was Atatas is paying for, uh, I think, for two years for welfare stray dogs to be in this building while they build an animal hospital. And you know, inevitably, you have those ratty eighth graders who just think everything is stupid and whatever. And it was amazing. I mean, the, the kids just loved the dogs. There were a few kids that were afraid of the dogs, um, so I had to sort of protect them from the over excitable dogs or whatever. But it was actually fun. And that was just so amazing to me, um, just to be able to hang out with the kids and the doggies. and. I think they're going to have changed their name to Welfare of Stray Cats because they now, they've been so successful in bringing the dog population down. They now have a lot of cats. So if you were a cat lover or a dog lover, there was something for you there. And um, it just was really a fun, um, a fun field trip to do after so long. And I just really want to thank God for that because he took my, <laughs> my fears and, and my dread and really made it a, a fun a fun day so that was great so thank you jesus for your presence throughout it was great yes, i just wanted to continue from the praise report last week i think when uh, you know after i had the healing and delivering session with anila and we had prayed also for my migraines now uh, this the last 10 days, I think, have been, I've had every possible trigger for a migraine. I had Rehan's birthday with 20 kids under the age of 10 in the house. Some football match. We went for the highway football match on Saturday. And I remember Uday asking for the, the migraine tablet because it was so hot. And we bought a whole strip because I thought if he needs one, I'll need three. Uh, but really praise God, no migraines through this entire week and uh, just praise Him for healing and praise God for Anila and what she's doing, you know, in those sessions. So, we're very happy to have Rahel and Luke here with us. Come, you have to come up front. Both of you. Yeah. Yes, we're doing an announcement now. Then we we'll follow with communion. So my praise report is that Rahel and Luke are both <laughs> are both here for the service today. Um, it's my great this time. I hope I don't make a mistake. I'll be very serious this time. <laughs> my great privilege and pleasure to publish the bands of marriage between Luke Sudesh. Bhagyanathan, Bachelor, son of Dr. J. R. B. Alfred and Dr. A. S. John 
of the pastorate of St. Paul's Cathedral, Diocese of Calcutta, Church of North India, and drum roll, <laughs> Raya Chakola, spinster, daughter of Joseph Chakola and Rachel Chakola of Highway. If any of you know any just cause why these two persons should not lawfully marry, you are to declare it in writing to me. This is the second time of asking. I'm sorry, I have a little bit of a cold. Um, so we just started communion. Dada told me very late last night that I'm going to communion today. He just dropped it on me. Sorry, no? Okay, so Dada told me just suddenly last night that I'm doing communion today. And again, like just God immediately just gave a thought of maybe what can be said and what can be shared. Um, basically the three significances of communion that came to me yesterday. For me, communion has always been the primary thing of the covenant and the renewing of the covenant whenever we take communion. But there's also two other aspects. The first being that Jesus before the Last Supper and before the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the wine, he is referred to himself as the bread of life and the living water. In both cases has said that he who comes to me and he who drinks of me will not hunger or thirst. And so the culmination of whatever he said at that point is very symbolic and real in the break, breaking of the bread and of the wine, drinking of the wine. And um, apart from this covenant, just being the covenant by itself, because normally when there is a covenant, the thing that was sacrificed in the Old Testament was another animal or another thing that may or may not have anything to do with the covenant itself. But in this case, God himself was the perfect sacrifice, and which makes that a perfect covenant, which I also realized later on that he never breaks, but we keep on stumbling and keep on breaking, but he doesn't hold us accountable to it if we just come back to him. So yeah, basically that's the thought. Um, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So this today's sermon is pretty intense, which is strange that God keeps giving me intense. I'm not going to say God gives me, but I keep getting intense insights, which is so contrary to my personality. So I'll start with a, a light story. There was once a, a preacher who was looking, a pastor, like pastor there, who is, who is looking through his, clo- his wife's closet for a tie or for something, and he finds a box. And in the box, he finds five eggs and a lot of money, like hundreds of thousands of dollars. And he's like shocked. Where has my wife got all this money from? And why are there eggs in this box? So he waits for his wife to come home. And he says, honey, where have you got all this money from? And she's like, "Uh, Sirhar, I have a secret. 20 years ago, when we got married, I decided that every time you tell a bad sermon, I will put an egg in this box. So then the husband felt very happy. He's like, wow, in 20 years, I've only told five bad sermons. That's pretty good. And then he said, but where's all the money come from? So the wife said, every time I got 12 eggs, I sold them and put the money in here. (laughs) So this was not just a joke. It's an insight to why mama has so much money in her door. We finally realized. But that's very loosely related to our topic. Our topic today is pride. It's about guarding against pride. So, um, before we start, uh, what I've been, I, I read a lot about learning and I'm very interested in learning and education and uh, I can't hold the mic, I feel like my hands shake. Can I try not holding the mic? 
Okay. Anyway, we haven't started, so now. Uh, I do a lot of research about education, and something very interesting is the model for education now is like something called the piggy bank model, where we assume the teacher has information and the teacher pours the information in the students. And as the teachers will know over here, that, that model is not very accurate because no matter how well the teacher teaches, if the student doesn't want to learn, he doesn't get it, she doesn't get it. As to the auntie, Carol, auntie will know, sometimes they can give amazing lessons and if the student doesn't think it's relevant, weeks later they've forgotten. It doesn't matter how many sermons on prayer Dada teaches, if we don't want to pray, we're not going to learn how to pray. So before we start today, I thought we could uh, reflect for one minute on uh, two questions before we get into uh, the word, which is, the sermons on pride and I want you to genuinely ask yourself one is pride something you struggle with is that a genuine struggle and it's not like a trick question like the answer has to be yes uh, my friend was telling me that in a church he was in every time they ask do you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior everyone stands because the right answer to the question do you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior is yes but this is not a trick question I want to genuinely think about is pride something that we struggle with individually and after that, after you've answered that question in your head, ask yourself is that something you want to change? Because you may think you struggle with it but it's not something you want to change about your life. Okay, so we'll have some silence, then I'll pray and then we'll go into the world. Gracious Heavenly Father, um, I'm so grateful that even so many centuries after you taught these things, that they are so relevant to my life and, and to our life and that you are still showing us how we can lead better lives, helping us deal with areas of weakness. I pray Holy Spirit today that uh, these words will be in line with your will and that they will convict whoever needs to be convicted and your, that your Holy Spirit will help us to change and be more like you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, a few months ago, this is, has been a long time, Prema and Esther sang a song called All Hail King Jesus during an online service. And during that song, uh, I, there was this insight that I had that really moved me and I found myself on the floor crying. And that's not normal. Uh, I, I don't cry that much, especially with Rahil here, I don't cry that much at all, but not only did I cry, but every time I thought about it, I kept crying and crying more. And that inside really moved me and it kind of uh, had a real impact on me and so that's why I thought it's, it's worth sharing and um, yeah, and it was about pride. Let's have a quick quiz, okay? If you think you're humble, please raise your hand. So we have one person. One person who this sermon is definitely for, and uh, we don't know about the rest. So two questions we are going to address today. One is, how does pride form in our hearts? How does it form? How does it grow? And two, how do we guard against pride? How do we keep ourselves from pride? Uh, the answers are very simple. Uh, how, do, how does pride form and grow? We'll address that and then we go to the next one later. So I grew up with siblings and a lot of people here grew up with siblings and you know that from the moment you're born you're compared to someone else especially if you have a twin brother and if you have elder siblings you're compared your whole life and I if you don't for those who don't know I have three brothers and um, two of them are elder and me and Jay got the worst me and my twin brother Jay got the worst end of the deal because when we went to school our parents thankfully didn't compare us a lot but the teacher was made up for that when we went to school, uh, we knew which teacher had been there before us and which teacher had Ashray. Because the teachers who had been there were like, oh gosh, you're Vinay's brother. And they just assumed we're bad kids. And the <laughs> teacher who had Ashray were like, wow, you're Ashray's brother. And they think we're very good kids. And then six months later, they'd be like, oh gosh, you're Ashray's brother. Why are you behaving like this? So on both ends, we were compared and we lost that comparison. Um, but we all have people we compare ourselves to and it's so natural in this um, in the society we live in and who you compare yourself to often influences how you feel about yourself how proud you are, how humble you are um, I'm not saying this to be humble I grew up thinking I was very average or very quite bad at playing the piano and that's not because I'm humble it's because I had a brother, I have a brother Winner, who's 
far superior to me in musical talent. So I grew up just thinking that Vinay is good, so I'm bad. And that automatically humbled me. And then later on, I met more people and realized, oh, maybe I'm not that bad. But all of us have people, siblings, friends, who we compare ourselves to. And if, if you're comparing yourself to someone who's better than you, you become humble automatically. But if you compare yourself to someone who's worse than you, you become proud. I have more stories of me becoming proud, but I don't want to share them. Uh, <laughs> but let's come to the story for today. It's Luke 18, 9 to 14. Extremely common story. Um, I'm just going to run through it because I think most, most of you all know it. This is the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. So Jesus told this parable and it says there, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. I'll just summarize it. Two men went into a temple, a Pharisee and a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself proud and said, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, like robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He didn't even look up. But he, he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus ends the parable by saying, one of these men went home justified before God. It's quite obvious the point Jesus was making. You look at the Pharisee and you look at the tax collector and the difference in the attitude is the Pharisee's attitude is his focus is on himself. I'm so great, I'm so good, I do this, I do that. His focus was on the other people, I'm better than him, I'm better than her, etc, etc. But the focus of the tax collector was on God. And the focus of the Pharisee was inward and outward, the focus of the tax collector was upward. And the irony of, in the story is that his focus was upward, which is why he didn't dare look upward. Because his focus was on God and he knew how holy God is and how undeserving he is in God's eyes. And that's why you see the humility in his response. And the key thing I want to highlight here is the difference in the prayer. The prayer of a proud person is, thank you God that I'm not like him. Thank you God that I'm not like her. Thank you God that I don't do that, I don't do that. And even if you don't start it with thank you God, you're probably saying I'm not like you and I'm not like you, I'm better than that person. But the prayer of a proud person, the prayer of a humble person, like the uh, tax collector, is sorry God that I'm not like you. And at the heart of pride is who are you comparing yourself to? Are you comparing yourself to your sister, to your brother, to your friends, to the other people in the church? Or are you comparing yourself to God? The point is not compare yourself to people who are better than you and feel like a terrible person. The point is that we as Christians have to focus on God and that will automatically humble us. We have like a cheat code, right? Other people can't do that. Other people don't know God, but we know a perfect God and if we keep our focus there, we will automatically become humble. Everything that the Pharisee was saying may have been true. He may have actually given all that and fasted and prayed. But all these things weren't, they didn't justify him. He didn't get to sit at God's table because he did X, Y, Z, right? The bottom line is, why do we become proud? We become proud because we compare ourselves to imperfect people rather than a perfect God, right? Now, coming to the next question, which is slightly harder to solve. How do we get rid of pride? The default answer seems compare yourself to God and not other people. But that's easier said than done. So, on a side note, I have a 100% guarantee solution. If you want to get rid of pride immediately, get three bigger brothers because they will humble you. They will, they will kill your ego. I, I know this. Shanti Andy probably knows this. She has elder brothers. They will wreck your ego and you will have no place for pride. But most of you cannot get siblings, cannot manufacture siblings. So we'll have to look at the second story today. 2 Samuel 9. Okay, so this is the story of David and Mephibosheth. I don't like that name. It's a very hard name to pronounce. A summary of the story, you can read this uh, entire story later if you want, is uh, King David is sitting on his throne and he remembers his friend Jonathan. And he had made this promise to Jonathan a long time ago, before he was king, that I will show kindness to your... Sorry, is there a problem? Ah. I will show kindness to uh, your family. 
and even though Jonathan was Saul, who is the last king's son, but he promised Jonathan that, and he's sitting on his throne thinking, is there anyone from Jonathan's family who I can show kindness to? And then they say there's one guy, one son remaining, his name is Mephibosheth. He, uh, his name, and uh, so David says, bring him to the court. And it seems like the situation of Mephibosheth is he's not only lame, he seems to have lost all his family property and not be in a good, and he seems to not be in a good state. And he's coming before David and he's scared out of his mind. Because in that time, a new king kills the old, king, old king's descendants. You see this in lions also, right? When a new lion comes into the pack, it kills all the cubs of the last lion, last alpha male. So when Mephibosheth is coming to King David, he is expecting to die. And David's response is, don't be afraid, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. And this is mind-blowing, right? Because he's expecting to die, and the king is not just destroying his land, he's not just not punishing him. The king is saying that you're going to now eat at my table like my children. And Mephibosheth is so moved by the king's kindness. You see his response. What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? He couldn't believe that the king would be so kind to someone so insignificant. Not only is he the previous king's uh, descendant, he's lame, he's not wealthy. And I love this story because it's an amazing picture of the good news of Jesus. That we are sinners and we deserve punishment. We deserve death. And we come before Jesus the king and he has every right to punish us but he forgives us. And then he goes to the next step to invite us to his table and to be a part of his family. Like Supriya was talking about. We have the privilege of not just being forgiven but being a part of God's family. So where is the problem? Why do we become pr proud? We become proud as Christians because we sit, w one of the reasons at least, is that we sit at God's table for so long that we kind of forget that we didn't earn our spot here, right? It happens to me, I don't know if it happens to you. We get into this place where we forget that we uh, were called to be at God's table because of His kindness and then we start judging other people, people from other churches, people in our church who are doing bad things, younger people, older people, people less righteous than us. We start pointing fingers and at the heart of it we forget that no Christian has the right to be proud because none of us have earned our spot at God's table. None of us have done anything worthy of sitting at God's table and being in God's family. So how can we point a finger at other people? And at the heart of that is, imagine we're sitting at God's table and, you know, I'm here and Swati and is there, Shanti and is there. And we're, we're constantly looking at the people ahead of us, people on the sides, the other people sitting at, at God's table and then we start judging. Like, oh, look what he's doing, look what her, she's doing. Oh, I'm better than her in that area. And at the heart of it, the problem is we're looking at the other people on the table and we're not looking at who's at the head of the table. That's King Jesus. Right? If our focus, human beings are terrible at multitasking. Apparently, a study showed that even women are bad at multitasking. Right? Because you can't focus on two things at one time. And you can either focus on Jesus and remember how amazing He is and be humbled, or you can focus on other people and feel good about yourself. Right? What, what Mephibosheth's response shows is what humility looks like. Humility is recognizing two things. He recognized the grandness of King David and he recognized how undeserving he was. And for us, if we want to be humble like him, like Mephibosheth, if we want to have that humility, we have to first recognize how amazing the God we serve is, how perfect he is. And we will automatically realize that we are completely undeserving. Not just recognize, we have to live in that reality, that the God we serve is so amazing and does not need to show us kindness, and yet he does. I remember, on a side note, I was talking to my friend Rohan, and uh, we, have, we have a friend who, uh, not a friend, we know of someone who um, made some really bad choices and ended up in a really bad situation. And we were lamenting on how could someone do something so, make so many bad choices, how could they do something so dumb, and both of us are talking about this. And suddenly in our conversation, there's a moment where we have this realization, which really stuck with me. The scary part of the story of what, what that person did was not how could they do that. The scary part was we could both imagine a scenario where we would do the same thing. 
and often when I realize often when we judge other people, we judge them for things that we either have done, either that we're capable of doing, and even if we couldn't do that thing, we've done a hundred other things that we know are not good enough, that we know fall short in God's eyes. Um, I heard the story of this guy called uh, Adio Resi. I can't pronounce his name very well, but he's an entrepreneur and before the age of 30, he sold $2 million companies. And that's amazing. And he was talking to a friend of his and he was saying, I feel like I've not done anything in my life. I feel like my life, like, I, I feel like I haven't achieved anything. And his friend's like, what's wrong with you? You sold these million dollar companies, you're successful, you're good at so many things, etc., etc., etc. How can you think you've not achieved anything? And he says, I've not done anything in comparison to my college roommate. His college roommate was Elon Musk, the billionaire. If you don't know who Elon Musk is, he's the richest man in the world right now, I think. But the point is, this guy was humbled by the fact that he was nothing in comparison to his roommate, because his roommate's the richest man on earth. How much more should we as Christians be humbled by the fact that we serve the God who is the creator of the universe? His reference point, the com person he's comparing himself to is Elon Musk. We should be comparing ourselves to Jesus. Right? Because that's what Jesus calls us to do. To be like him. And if we're falling short, how much more should that humble us? If this guy was humbled by comparing himself to another person. The two dangers of pride are, one, it's a blind spot. You can see it in other people, but you can't see it in yourself. Right? That's why Jesus accepted the, uh, accepted the sinners and not the Pharisees. Because the sinners knew that they were sinners. The Pharisees thought they were so great that they couldn't see their own sin. There was a Sunday school teacher who once taught on this passage about the Pharisee and the tax collector. And she ended her lesson by saying, okay kids, now let's thank God that we're not like the Pharisee. And that's exactly how pride works, right? You see it in other people and you immediately do it yourself. Move the side. Yeah. That's why actually the question I asked in the start is a trick question. Quite often, we don't know that pride is building up in ourselves. Because it's so easy to spot in others, but so hard to see in ourselves. And the, the main thing I want to get at is for us, I know that this is relevant to our church in that pride indicates, if you have pride, that we've forgotten the reality of who God is. Right? That we're not living in the reality of who God is. Because if you're living in the reality of who God is and how perfect the God we serve is, then, like Mephibosheth said, you will be humbled all the time. But if you're focused on other things and other people, then you're, no, you're going to get proud. So then, what's the answer? How do we guard against pride? The problem is that we forgot, we've forgotten who God is, that we don't hold that close. So the solution is that we need to remind ourselves constantly of who the God we serve is and live in that reality. I can only tell you what I do. I'm sure there are many better things you all may think of doing. But when I realize this, what I try to do is, every day when I pray, I start by thinking about, and it takes effort, but thinking about the fact that the God I am praying to is the God of the universe, is a, is a perfect holy God who does not need me, right? And once you realize how amazing God is and you live in that, you automatically think of all the ways you fall short, right? But it shouldn't end there, because then you'll just feel terrible about yourself. And that's not the purpose. The purpose is to recognize that we've fallen short, and then marvel at the fact that God wants to show us kindness, and He invites us to sit at His table. Right? God shows us so much kindness, that even though we don't deserve, He lets us be a part of His family. And when we live and constantly remember that, we will extend that to others. Mama told me something very profound. We all have no problem taking God's grace for granted. It's only when it comes to extending that grace to other people that we suddenly become very stingy, you know? As Christians, we don't become gracious and kind because, you know, magically one day we're transformed. If that happens to you, then great. You know, some people it happens to. But the, as Christians, we should be gracious because we have no right not to be. Because God has shown us so much kindness. You know, it's not a choice for us. In, in summary, how do we become proud? We become proud by comparing ourselves to imperfect people and not a perfect God. And how do we guard against pride? 
by constantly reminding ourselves of the big perfect God who we serve. In that process, we'll remember how undeserving we are. Second thing we need to do is stop looking at other people who are sitting at the table or who are not sitting at the table. Stop looking at everyone else on God's table, outside God's table, but keep our eyes fixed on the person sitting at the head of the table. That's our King Jesus. Uh, coming back to what happened to me, I'm going to end with this. Coming back to what happened to me when I heard Prema Neston singing this song a few months ago. Um, as a kid, I had a very weird image of heaven. Whenever I had an argument with my parents or my brothers, I used to think, when I go to heaven, God will show you that I'm right. And I had this picture in my mind that God's going to line up all the people who were wrong in an argument and show them that I'm right in all those situations. Uh, no. I, I don't think that anymore, although I still hope for it. Uh, but the insight I had that day was about God, about heaven. And I, I don't know if I can recreate it. I, I just try to communicate it. I realized that day sitting that one day I'm going to die. And all of us are going to die if you didn't know. And I'm going to go to heaven. And when I enter God's court, I'm going to be in front of God and He's going to be surrounded by angels. His glory is going to emanate from the throne. He's going to be big and magnificent. And in front of Him, I'm going to be so puny and small. And I'm going to, in that moment, be so aware of all the ways in which I don't deserve to be here. And in that moment, right now I'm picturing it, I don't know if I can, uh, if you all can picture it, but in that moment, in front of God's throne, I'm just going to be feeling so inferior and so unworthy. And then God is not only going to not condemn me, He's going to call me and tell me to sit at His throne and eat with Him for the rest of eternity. And I know that the only response that I will have is, um, who am I that you should take notice of a dead dog like me? Why would this God, oh gosh, everyone's crying today. Why would this God, who's so magnificent, even care about someone like me? And that's so amazing that for all of us, we're going to be in front of a God who does not need us at all and who knows every wrong thing we've done and who's going to still call each one of us and say, come and eat at my table for the rest of your lives. <laughs> Let's pray. Dear Jesus, even now I'm so aware of the ways in which I fall short. And I think it's so amazing that you managed to turn that around and make it a story of how good you are and how kind you are. I thank you that you invite me to be a, a son of yours and to sit at your table despite knowing every way in which I don't deserve to. Now on behalf of myself and of everyone here who wants to, sorry for every way in which I have looked down on other people inside the church, outside the church. Sorry for every way in which I pulled myself into thinking that I deserve to be here and forgotten that everything that I have is because of your grace and your kindness. I pray that we will live in your kindness and that we will extend that kindness to others. Not because we feel like it, but because we really have no right not to do it because of how loving you meant to us. Pray that what you show me and the kindness and the grace that you've allowed me to recognize that each person here will also be able to, if they haven't already. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
even as Akshay kept referencing this song as a way in which uh, he was dealing with pride also brought it to his mind. I was thinking, yeah, that one of the ways we can deal with pride is hailing Jesus, all hail King Jesus, worship, praise and just remember that familiar picture of David dancing before the ark and uh, when he when he got to the ark he was wearing uh, the robes of a king and in comparison to the people he would have been uh, glorious and splendid but then we are told that he took off those robes and he put on the garment of a priest and he was now a worshipper before God and so the whole for him, in his heart you can see that humility uh, where earlier there could have been tried and we see that we see therefore the power of worship in uh, the worship lifts our eyes to God uh, in helping us to remain humble
truly lord even as we begin to contemplate how awesome how majestic how beautiful how great you are we stumped for words and they just fall short just pray lord that we will never ever lose our wonder we will never lose sight and focus on just how amazing and big you are you are king of kings you are lord of lords you are name above every other name and really who are we that you are mindful of us but king of the universe you are king of our hearts bring our roving eyes back to you let our hearts be constantly set upon you we just want you to be our guiding light our pillar we want to become more like you lord more and more of you and less and less of us we really give you all glory and honor and praise you deserve so so much more but really from not just our lips and our tongues but from the very depths of our beings we want our lives to be lives of worship and honor to you our most high king in your matchless powerful beautiful name lord jesus we pray